Breaking news. Turns out the blast radius from an 11-year-old 11 11 sex scandal can still prove lethal. If you're the labor secretary, Alex Acosta, who prior to serving in Donald Trump's cabinet, served as the top prosecutor in Miami, out today over his role in negotiating a sweetheart deal for accused pedophile and sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. As the scandal dragged into its fifth day, Donald Trump bid Acosta farewell on the South Lawn with a sorry, not sorry to see you go. Alex, I think you'll agree. I said, you don't have to do this. He doesn't have to do this. He made a deal that people were happy with, and then 12 years later, they're not happy with it. You'll have to figure all of that out. But the fact is, he has been a fantastic secretary of labor. Trump, known to be consumed by media coverage of his administration, was clearly not distraught about the deal that Acosta negotiated for Epstein, but concerned about the bad press Acosta was getting. From the Washington Post, quote, Trump did not originally want to be seen as cutting ties with him over a decade-old episode, even as some of his longest advisors believed Acosta's departure was inevitable, given the cascade of sustained news coverage and the facts of the case. With Acosta out of the picture, sure Trump is still trying to put distance between himself and Epstein. I was not a fan of Jeffrey Epstein, and you watched people yesterday saying that I threw him out of a club. I didn't want anything to do with him. That was many, many years ago. It shows you one thing, that I have good taste, okay? Now, other people, they went all over with him. They went to his island. They went all over the place. He was very well known in Palm Beach, but... Jeffrey Epstein was not somebody that I respected. I threw him out. In fact, I think the great James Patterson, who's a member of Mar-a-Lago, made a statement yesterday that many years ago I threw him out. I'm not a fan of Jeffrey Epstein. The pedophile, the prosecutor, and the president. That is where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance, White House reporter for The Washington Post, Ashley Parker. With us at the table, former Assistant Director for Counterintelligence at the FBI, Frank Figluzzi. Karine Jean-Pierre's back. She's Senior Advisor to MoveOn.org and Executive Editor for Bloomberg Opinion. Tim O'Brien is here. I want to start with you, Joyce Vance, and just this 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 leap into a, a parallel universe where on the day that uh, it is unsustainable for the labor secretary to continue to serve in the Trump administration, no one utters the word victim. No one says a word about a miscarriage of justice. All they say is read the James Patterson fictionalized version of this sex scandal. I never liked him and I didn't make a cost to go. What, what, where have we, what is happening, Joyce? Trump just doesn't seem to understand that justice isn't just another deal. And this is so hard, I think, to watch as a prosecutor, knowing that when you enter into a plea agreement in a case, you have equities that you have to be aware of. You have a community. You have victims. You have the courts. And you're trying to do the right thing. You're not just delivering a deal. The president apparently views this as purely transactional. It's an old deal without any concern for the victims that were left behind when this happened. And the notion that Acosta is leaving without any conversation about the victims and about what this means for women in the era of Me Too is, I just think, tone deaf completely. It's tone deaf. And for Acosta to walk out the door without cleaning up any of the damage to his own reputation, Frank, is stunning to me as a former uh, person who handled communications for, for, for high-level government officials to not stand there and say, I did my best, but I'm sorry that I presided over a system that failed these young victims. These weren't women, these were girls. These were children. Some of their lives were ruined. Some of them are dead. I mean, to, to not, I mean, we, we cover the dehumanization of migrants at the border. We cover um, the flippant way Donald Trump talks about dictators, but we don't have a lot of tangible examples of people actually being dehumanized in real time. The treatment of this case of the Epstein victims has been the dehumanization of girls and women in real time. Oh, we're living in an era where children are being detained in inhumane conditions by this administration. So why would we expect any kind of remorse or apology from Acosta or from Trump? And, you know, let's be clear here. 
Acosta leaving is not because of any moral outrage from this president. Correct. It's the coverage. It's, it's clearly because he's reading the tea leaves. And he understands, more than we probably give him credit for, where this is going. Yeah. Public corruption investigators are tearing apart the U.S. attorney's handling of this in Miami. And this isn't going to get better. It's going to get more and more ugly for Acosta and likely his staff at the time in Miami. And this image of Acosta standing for half an hour on the White House lawn next to Trump is going to come back to haunt them during the 2020 campaign. Well, let me press you on that. What does that investigation look like? I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what it looks like. It looks like interviews of all the AUSAs and FBI agents in South Florida who handled this case, the police officers who interacted with those agents and prosecutors, and they're going to figure out what was the phone activity, who was dangled money, cash, jobs by Epstein and or his cutouts, mm. and where are these people today? Who objected to the deal in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and was that documented or not? Ashley Parker, your colleague Bob Costa said something on this program on Wednesday that sort of sent a um, chill up my spine. He said that what every journalist in uh, the country worth his or her salt is pursuing is the answer to what was Trump's knowledge? What was Trump's knowledge of Jeffrey Epstein's conduct? I haven't seen that reported out anywhere, but I wonder your theory of that case. Well, we know just from that one comment um, that has gotten some attention, I believe it was to New York Magazine in 2002, that, that the president had at least some general awareness. There's that quote where he praises Jeffrey Epstein as a great guy and sort of says something along the lines of, and I'm not, this is not verbatim, but something along the lines of, like me, he enjoys beautiful women, his often a lot younger. Um, so this was an open secret uh, in the circles that Jeffrey Epstein ran, in the circles that the president traveled in. It was something that the president sort of spoke openly about. Again, we don't know if we, if he knew that Jeffrey Epstein was raping and abusing young girls, but he was certainly aware that Jeffrey Epstein was often surrounded by very young women. Tim O'Brien, let me put up those headlines that Ashley just referenced. Trump called Epstein a terrific guy who enjoyed younger women before denying a relationship with them. So he was close enough to know what kind of women he surrounded himself with. Jeffrey Epstein was a terrific guy. From the New York Times, Donald Trump once said, now he's not a fan. That story, I believe, chronicled a party where women were flown in and the only two men in attendance were Jeffrey women. Epstein, 28 women, I think, 20. Jeffrey Epstein and Donald Trump and Vanity Fair, uh, just him and Epstein and 28 girls. Florida man drops a dime on Trump. So when the president stands on the White House lawn and says he barely knew Jeffrey Epstein, that is just not supported by the fact pattern. They knew each other well from 1987 to at least 2002. He traveled on Epstein's jet at least once. Epstein was either a member at Mar-a-Lago in name or in substance, but he was there all the time, and the president wanted him to be there. Uh, I, you know, I spent about two years of a lot of time with Trump in the mid-2000s. He routinely talked about Jeffrey Epstein as someone he, he admired. He felt that they were in sync. What uh, do you admire about him? Uh, he liked that he was free to pursue women whenever he wanted to. He liked that he had a lot of money to spend in any way he wanted to. He liked that he was someone who uh, I think didn't care about the law or civility or women being targets, because I think that's frankly the way the president approaches the world. Uh, you know, at one point when I was working on the, on the book about him, he took me uh, on the Upper East Side. He had just bought the rights to the Miss America pageant. And uh, we went up there and he said, you know, the, one of the main things I'm really excited about owning this uh, pageant is that I can, introduce, I can introduce these girls to Eric, to his son Eric. And, and we went into the, you know, into the offices of the pageant and, and it was just, it was a very uncomfortable environment with him around these women because I think his sole reason for buying the pageant, it was not a business decision, it was an access to women decision. Uh, in some of the court papers that have come out, Jeffrey Epstein said he wanted to buy a modeling agency because he wanted to use a modeling agency in the same way the president at the time, the same way Donald Trump used his modeling agency. Again, access to women. So there's a lot of similarities in how these two men approach the world. And it is not credible that the president had, didn't have an, a, a close relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. And they were worried about it up until Election Day. I, you know, shortly before the election, uh, Michael Cohn and David Peckert, the National Enquirer, were having 
discussions about whether or not questions would come up about Jeffrey Epstein's island and who had visited the island. Uh, so it was clearly front of mind for them at least until Election Day. You know, and I, I think it's important to be careful. Uh, every journalist that's been on this show, every lawyer that's been on this show has been careful. But Donald Trump is credibly accused of sexual deviance and misconduct ranging from rape from E. Jean Carroll just a couple weeks ago to misconduct to things that don't fall under a criminal umbrella. But there are examples of him walking behind stage at the Miss America pageant scrutinizing the near naked bodies of young women. So I, I guess my question. But there also there also was, you know, there were, during the election, a, a woman filed a Jane Doe lawsuit alleging that Trump had raped her in, in Jeffrey Epstein's townhouse in New York. She withdrew the, withdrew the suit. Her lawyer said she withdrew the suit because after she filed it, she got death threats. Uh, I don't know anything about the facts around that other than that. But I do think that, uh, um, as you say, there, there isn't just, it's not just hearsay with Trump. There's a lot of examples of him walking up to a boundary. There's yet to be examples of him crossing it in the way that Epstein did. Corrine, why isn't this a more salient political anchor around his neck? Why? And I remember when Hillary Clinton made an issue out of some of these accusations. She, um, I think, aligned herself with uh, Ms. Machado, who Donald Trump had called Miss Piggy in a chat. Yeah. But it's all the same bucket of abusive, denigrating, derogatory, and in these accusations, far more serious criminal conduct around women? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question because I think what has happened is, as we all say, nothing, everything we see is not normal, right? None of this is normal. But what Donald Trump has managed to do is make it normal. It's, it's the most bizarre kind of backward things that we're seeing. Like, just what you were describing, I was thinking about what you were saying about Epstein and Donald Trump. Those are things that you hear in a movie. Those right? are things that end and, the political career right? of anyone of before Donald Trump. It's so true. And, but you, you hear about it in the movie, but it's playing out in the White House, right in front of us, right? We, so, we see Donald Trump essentially doing the perp walk, walking with Alex Acosta and giving this 30-minute press conference. First of all, Alex Acosta should have never had the job in the first place. And let's not forget who was supposed to have that job. It was the labor secretary that he really wanted was, was accused of beating his wife. Like, these are the type of people that he's bringing into the White House, into his administration. So what is not normal becomes in this weird way normal normal because we're talking about all of these awful things week after week after week. Next week it'll be something else. Ashley Parker, I've started, and maybe this is oversharing, I've started to wonder in, in this sort of vein of normalizing Donald Trump's conduct, if those of us that talk about it and cover it are part of the problem. Do you ever sit down and type a lead and say, I can't believe I just wrote that? I mean, I wrote that line, you know, a president, a pedophile, and a prosecutor, and I thought, wh where am I? Well, I will say there's, there's something we've started doing at The Post, which is recognizing that stuff happens that in any other administration would end a career or dominate a news cycle, and it sort of takes up you know, three hours or six hours because something else pushes it from the headlines. And, and we are aware of that. So we sometimes try to go back and take an issue that may have moved out of the news cycle, but is still really important and give it the second look that it deserves. Um, an example was we sort of took some time and went back and really recreated what happened in President Trump's response to Charlottesville. Um, we've done that on some other issues. But as a journalist, there sort of is, I think, an industry wide recognition that, that a lot of these issues don't necessarily get the time they deserve because there is just such a cascade and fire hose of news in terms of what you were saying, the, the headlines we're writing, the leads we're writing, and even the time we can devote to, to some of this coverage. Well, and I appreciate that, you, that we all kind of hit pause here and let this sink in. I, I want to let this sink in for you and for Joyce. This is Kamala Harris on um, the, the, the Alex Acosta's defense of the agreement. That's not normal either. Let's listen. Any prosecutor worth their salt, yeah. especially one who, who understands the nature of these cases, which any prosecutor should if they're taking the case on, mm -hmm. knows that this is the exact kind of case yeah. that is typical of somebody who's preyed on children. And that case should go before a jury, and that person should go to prison for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully it's gone well now. But I mean, hopefully he will, but... 
but, but you know, the thing that, that I found, obviously, you can tell by the tone of my, my perspective, the thing that I found so troubling, disheartening, and really unbelievable was the way that Acosta has described the challenge he had. Because mm. it's like saying it's really difficult to make an omelet. Well, then it get out the kitchen if you don't know how to cook. Ashley, this is something I've heard from the right and the left from the legal community this week. Any thoughts on, on sort of how Acosta's, I know the performance was viewed as passable um, from the president's perspective in the White House, but the legal arguments are not holding up with the test of time. Well, there was a sense, again, in the White House that he sort of initially, he made a somewhat forceful case for why he made that decision um, at the time. But in talking to people as the week progressed, there was also a sense, especially when we heard um, from the state prosecutor, the state attorney general, I believe, sort of saying this is absolutely false. And when does a, a federal um, attorney general defer to the state? He had a 53-page indictment. He absolutely could have gone forward um, if he had wanted to. I think that has become increasingly the prevailing sentiment, even if in the hours after his news conference there was a sense that he sort of, quote unquote, won by doing himself no harm. And, and one final point is that, it, again, sort of the performative aspect in the White House is everything. There were some people who did want to see him be more animated. And then I was talking to someone today who said they wanted to see him sort of show more compassion, not just an mm. animated defense of himself that the president might have wanted to see. But these were these were w young women. These were children. They were raped. They were abused. And it might have been at the very least, regardless of if it would have saved his career or not, an appropriate moment to sort of speak to them and show some empathy and compassion. Joyce, um, Ashley referenced that 53 page indictment. Here's the Miami Herald's description of that. Lest we let the, the facts of this get to too far from our conversations. Facing a 53-page federal indictment, Epstein could have ended up in federal prison for the rest of his life. But a deal was struck, an extraordinary plea agreement that would conceal the full extent of Epstein's crimes and the number of people involved. That one sentence, that one, or one paragraph, two sentences, seems at the moment to be the sum total of Alex Acosta's legacy. At the time that Acosta made this decision, DOJ guidelines for prosecutors required us to charge the most serious, readily provable offense in a case. So for Acosta to abandon this indictment that he had prepared that was supported by evidence with victims who were willing to come forward is inexplicable. And in hindsight now, all of these years later, for him to stand up and defend that decision is really inexplicable too. On this same timeline, I had a case in my office. I was our appellate chief. It was a case involving making pornography with, with young victims. And the prosecutor at sentencing, the, the sentence that she received was not the maximum sentence. It was long enough, though, to keep that defendant in jail functionally for the rest of his life. And she was outraged. She wanted to appeal the judge. She wanted every last minute, every last day she was entitled to of this sentence. That's how strongly prosecutors feel about these cases and about protecting young children. I don't understand Acosta's point of view here. I want to ask you about the role of money. I mean, we talk a lot about um, you know miscarriage of justice for, for, for women. Acosta trotted out this ludicrous argument about things were so different. It wasn't you know 1907. It was it was 2008. Um, you know, I, I, but 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 money seems to be the variable, not a point in time. So much of what Acosta said in his weak defense simply doesn't ring true. For one of the most disturbing portions of my FBI career, I supervised a Crimes Against Children squad in Northern California. Mm. And I have to tell you, it still impacts me today. And I can tell you this, no U.S. attorney, no assistant U.S. attorney ever said to me, I'm feeling a lot of pressure from this defense team. I really think the money they're throwing around on this is going to hurt us. Uh, we've got to cut a deal. It does not happen when you're talking about exploiting children. Does it happen in white collar crime, big time corporate defense? I've been involved in indictments and convictions in cases in Fortune 100 corporations. And yes, they have incredibly powerful attorneys. And yes, there's a lot of money thrown around. But to hear Acosta equate that kind of environment to a case where women, young girls are being exploited sexually, 
it, it simply doesn't happen. Something's wrong with this picture, and I continue to say that's why we see public corruption prosecutors involved in this SDNY case. You know, also to, to what Frank was saying about how, you know, the pressure's not going to step up on Acosta in Florida. There's another piece of this in New York uh, with, I think, uh, you know, and, and the other shoe to drop, which are what kind of records uh, does, did Jeffrey Epstein have in his vaults? Yeah. And are there films or photographs? And, uh, you know, yeah, Trump... Yeah, Ashley's paper, has, uh, David Farenthold, I believe, reported that in an address book he had 12 entries for the Trumps, Donald Trump. That, that, that was originally, Gawker originally yeah. had that. That's been out there for years, yeah. but I think the but thing you're right, here, he was a meticulous note-taker. A meticulous note-taker. He had cameras and security in all of his homes. Um, the issue of whether or not he was blackmail, blackmailing people who funded his money management firm, his, quote, money management firm, because I don't think he was actually managing money. Mm. Um, uh, the issue that arises there is Trump had an alliance with David Pecker. Trump routinely threatened journalists with tape recordings. I would go and meet with him. He go, you don't mind if I, I tape this? And when we litigated with him under, in a deposition, we, we said, you don't really have a tape, taping system, do you? And he said, no. But he would tell people in New York, he would tell uh, business competitors that uh, they should watch out what they were doing, what they were doing, because he could go to David Pecker or the Today Show or page six in the New York Post and embarrass them. And I think that one of the, when, when Trump is standing on the White House lawn and saying that there's no proof that he had a close relation with Jeffrey Epstein, there's going to be uh, the Southern District of New York, which has already looked at Becker's relationship with Trump land and Stormy Daniels, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the same thing with Trump and Epstein and video recordings. And there could, there could be, I don't know that there is, but I think there is a possibility that it could be a very visible record of their relationship. More questions than answers. Right. On hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.